Hello and welcome back to Tips of the Trade by Psalms for Psalms. We have a little bit of a change of venue today, but we've got an exciting topic, great guest. We have Lindsay Huntsman, manager of the Glen Ellen Star here to talk about the business side of the uh, of the business. Uh, the, Psalm part the, the, the Psalm part is gonna take the back seat to the manager part right now. And what we're gonna talk about is kind of with the rise of uh, the, the hybrid role, the Somager role. Managilier. Managing, yes. Yeah, Manage, so, man, okay, yeah. we're going to turn around. Yeah, we, okay. I, it's a little bit, that's a little bit more sensitive. Okay, so Managilier. All right. Yeah. So we're going to talk about how to be successful <laughs> in that aspect of your job so that you can do everything that you want to do. So, Lindsay, welcome to the show. And uh, tell you. us about your background, how you came up and uh, ended up where in you are now. In food. Um, so I, or food and wine, I, I, uh, it all started out when I, I took a semester off from college and I ended up working in a wine and cheese shop. And I had no idea that there were more than three kinds of cheese, that there wasn't just yellow, white, and the one with the holes in it. Yeah. And I was so amazed that there was this whole world of like culture and countries and language and history and that had just, there, were, there was so much that was attached to food and I, and I didn't grow up with that, I grew up with like baked potatoes and like Stouffer's lasagna. And so this, it was like somebody just opened a portal into another universe. And so when I went back to college, um, I started working as a line cook and was just terrible at it. And so then I thought I would go to uh, the Culinary Institute of America and then I was pretty terrible at that still. It didn't really help me very much, I was still terrible. <laughs> so then I was like, well maybe I'll be a food writer because I like food. And so then I went to work for the LA Times a little bit and then they fired everybody. Okay. <laughs> and then I started uh, learning about wine when I was in LA, and that was kind of my, the the savior of that like kind of sad dark time in my life. And um, moved back to Napa and started managing. I've been managing for about five years, and uh, was able to uh, use my wine education to uh, get a management job, but then also in turn use my management experience to put me in a position to become a psalm and, and have my own list. And um, it's just been great. I finally feel like I, I have a, a job that is perfect for me. Great, yeah. great. Well, I'm fascinated by this show because I think it's going to cover things that are a little different than what we normally touch on with the show. And uh, just to point it out, no, no where the guest has come with an itinerary of, uh, of everything lined out. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this and, <laughs> and we're going to talk about these things. Um, the role of the Samaj, I mean, how do you think that, or the uh, no, Anagelia, yes. Um, you know, how, how do you think that evolved? Why, what do you think caused that, that uh, I mean, you know, start seeing less floor psalms? It's and, just finances. I mean, we, uh, most restaurants don't have the, the, don't have enough money to, to run a management team and a song. Uh, so they are looking for, and a lot of the, you know, you look on ads on Craigslist, what they're looking for is somebody who knows how to manage a beverage program, but also knows how to write a schedule, you know, knows how to look at a P&L, knows what your labor cost is, knows, it, it knows how to run a reservation book. You know, they, they're usually hybrid jobs mm -hmm. because our margins are so low in restaurants. If you have somebody that can do both, in a you know a smaller restaurant maybe not maybe not the French Laundry something that has a lot of mm -hmm. um, assets or you know that 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 has that ability but in a tiny little restaurant we have to play a lot of roles and have a lot of hats. Okay, so how would you break down the the tasks that you do as a? Yeah, so we were talking earlier. The, the, the sad part is that wine usually takes the back seat. It's kind of like the dessert portion of the day. It's the best part. Um, and, but it has to be the, you know, like dessert, it's got to be small and, you know, you have to be a little bit of a diet because if you focus too much on that, other things are going to go. So a, a lot of my day is involved with guest relations, um, you know, making sure that our reservation book is laid out appropriately, that the kitchen isn't going to get slammed, that uh, we have enough room for walk-ins, that our all of our emails are being answered our schedule for the staff is appropriate if I have on calls do I need them tonight do I need to cut because we have a slow night um, any ordering that I need to do uh, you know non-alcoholic beverage or front of the house supplies things that aren't like so fun to mm -hmm. order so yeah, yeah so yeah. yeah. so <laughs> and uh, seafood towels go through a lot of seafood towels sure. in um, hiring and firing which is a really 
stressful one and training lots and okay. lots of training and coaching and and watching and just you know basically if you are doing your job right as the manager nobody knows that you're there <laughs> which is a really sad but but uh Unfortunate truth, if you are making everybody else's job easier, mm -hmm. your job is to lubricate the restaurant, and make sure all the parts are working. Well, that gets us to another point about staff training and how do you develop a strong core team that's loyal, they stick around and they back you up and that you, so you can get to that point. You so know, what, so what are some hiring techniques that you is the use? first part. I mean, hiring is so important. Um, and the most important thing you can do when somebody comes into your door and they want a job, uh, and even if they, you know, they haven't called ahead, or, go meet them. Uh, one of our best, uh, our, our best buster, I mean, this kid is a star. I keep on saying he's going to be like the GM of a Four Seasons in like five years. Like, <laughs> he right. probably do my, he just walked in and someone was like, oh, somebody wants a job. You need to get off whatever seat you are, or wherever you are, and, and just go shake their hand. You will know in about 45 seconds whether or not they are good. Okay. I talked to him for two minutes and, I, and then I was polite and we talked another 10 minutes. So we didn't think that the interview was like too short. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're hired. I know that you are, you're great, you're gonna be great for us. Um, so hiring good people and, and being aware of having, you know, just being able to get good people in the restaurant at any time, and even if, you, if there isn't a need. You know, we, I just hired someone who's, who's really great and we're, we're really excited about him. We only have a couple of shifts, but mm -hmm. maybe we'll grow into that position, you know? Building a good team. What are some things you look for as far as experience or is it just the, that kind of Thing experience, about hospitality, attitude, good, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I definitely do a little once over on the resume. Um, checking references is really important. I don't think a lot of people do that in this industry. I think we just take a lot of things in face value where we don't have um, the time. But it is really important to do because a lot of people aren't really able to say what they want to say in a reference, but you can hear from tone of voice whether or not this person is really excited about this past employee or where they really want them to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, you can also know how well the employee was engaged with their previous boss and if they if you know this previous boss loved them knows everything about them then obviously this is someone okay. who's a go-getter if it's a boss like oh yeah they were here they worked here it was good yeah <laughs> maybe not oh, yeah you know? i remember oh yeah um, okay. but i i really hire for personality more than anything because i it's our job is to be the best people that we can be for our guests and the mechanics of it are, are pretty easily trained. Now suppose someone does pull off a very good Eddie Haskell and gets past you. Oh it's happened, yeah. I've been conned. I've been conned. Uh, so what do you times. what do you do to one him. well to one maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe train them, maybe keep them, you know, keep them up space, or do you just kick them to the curb right away? No, you give them time. Okay. Them, I usually give, um, I usually give them about two months. The first month, um, you know, so, some people take a while. Some people really need their own space to grow. And you know, so so the first couple of days that they're there, I just kind of take a back seat, let them be trained by the other staff, who's and just kind of watch. Then when they're live. I kind of, I will be a little bit more on them when, mm -hmm. when you know, not when they're being trained by another, I'll, I'll watch them coach a little bit more. Uh, and usually about after a month and a half, we know whether or not it's working. Uh, and, but we'll do several different coaching sessions and it'll be formal as well. You know, we'll sit down. What do you think happened tonight? Why do you think it happened? Uh, what, what could have gone better? You know, what, what, what can, what can I do to help you? you know, was there something that we're missing? Uh, that we can add to the equation that's going to make it help better. Okay. And then, and then you just at some point there's going to be a time where you're going to have to let them go if it doesn't work out. You know, you have to give them multiple chances. I mean, you have to do lots of little informal, you know, conversations on the floor and a couple formal conversations um, in, in your office. And if it just seems like we've said this, we've talked about this three or four times, and th that's fine. We can go. You know that, and it, just do it as gently as possible. But it can be a traumatic experience yeah, for everyone involved, yeah. yeah. So what are some things you do to kind of build the team and that cohesiveness? I mean, you're a small restaurant. It seems like you got a really tight group of people. We that have an work incredible together, so team. It's how did you build that crazy. kind of esprit de corps amongst um, the... Uh, the large part of it was just having really great people, knowing from the get-go, and um, listening to what people have to say. I think a lot of managers don't... They, As a manager, you're in a position of power, but, but really you are an advocate for your employees. So if you're not listening to something that's bothering them, 
they feel dis- they, disempowered and they feel like you're not creating an environment that's conducive. But so if you try to create a, a great environment, if you listen to their problems and, and maybe, maybe it's something silly or maybe it's something that's real, but it's to acknowledge it and try to make steps to, mm-hmm. to improve or to get them to understand why things are that way, I think that they become really supportive of you. Um, but yeah, just, you know, and checking in all the time. How are mm-hmm. you doing? You know, several times a night, like I'll just run, you know, it'll be a crazy, crazy night. I'll run by someone and be like, how's your section? Are you good? What's, yeah. that table looks like they might need something. Are they right? You want me to go there? No, just constant checking in with people. Uh-huh. I remember hearing uh, Paul Grecker once said that, you know, he goes to work and he basically focuses on taking care of his guests, his, his staff. He treats his staff yes. as his guests, so yeah. that he takes care exactly. of his staff, and he knows that if he well, takes care I, of his staff. When I was interviewing for my first management position, that, which I didn't get, <laughs> the, uh, the interviewer said, you know, like, you're a great server now, but it's not going to be about the guests. It's going to be about the staff. And, and I, I remember hearing it, but I don't think I really heard it until about five years later when mm-hmm. I like, really mm-hmm. understood. Yeah, you mm-hmm. are, you're basically the server for your guests. It's an interesting yeah, way to look for at your it. Server for yeah. your server, not for your guests, for your, uh, for your staff. Yeah. Looks like we got a question here. We do have a lot of people watching you live online right now, Lindsay. Hello. No problem. And um, <laughs> you may or may not know this name here, but I, I, I have to mention uh, Douglas Trapasso says hello from Chicago. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Oh. Douglas was practicing blind tasting <laughs> a while back when uh, Sir was on. Oh, asking okay. some questions, getting ready for a certified. I do remember. So, yeah, hey, so. Douglas, and everybody send us your questions live. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll yeah. answer him right here yeah. for Lindsay and Scott. So do we have a question or did you just say That hello? was a hello from Chicago. Oh, okay. Hello They're just Chicago testing the waters. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you guys are uh, <laughs> you know, buried under snow, so you might as well watch uh, the show on the tube, right? So awesome. Great, great to have you here, Douglas, and good luck on that uh, certified if you haven't done it already. Uh, so we were talking about that interview and the job that you didn't mm-hmm. get, uh. and you said that you had... <laughs> now developed a few things to, to talk about and things numbers in particular and what are those or things how that you, to get an interview yeah what are those things that you need to do to master to so I brought get a, that job I brought interview. a prop all right <laughs> you can zoom in on this <laughs> zoom or? in on the prop this is the uniform system of accounts for restaurants <laughs> it does not sound very exciting but it is only about 140 pages long. You can read it in a weekend. It's uh, put out by the National Restaurant Association. This will give you an incredible knowledge of your financial reports, uh, what a balance sheet is, what an income statement or a P&L is, what a cash flow statement is. Oh, you want to see it again? You want to really get in here? Now, is um, that something you can get at like, <laughs> Amazon or something? Or? You get, yes, it's kind of expensive. It's about 60, 60 bucks on Amazon. But it will take you about a weekend to okay. read this. And if you go for an interview and you know what these are, they actually have little, great little, um, they're like uh, rules of thumb, I think they call them here. And it's, uh, where is it? They're like rules of thumb, know what your prime cost for a restaurant should be. 65% is about what you want. You know, or, or any more than that, you might be struggling. And it gives you little hints. What's a great bottle beer price what's a great draft beer you know cost mm-hmm. of goods sold and uh if you know those numbers or and you just or you don't have to know them 100 percent. if you just feel comfortable with them and you're in an interview and asking the manager the general manager owner who's interviewing you will score so many more points than the other person who just you know picked up a menu and knows the food or mm-hmm. you know just his knows a little bit about table service awesome well think you know 60 bucks um What's the cost of getting a job and having and being successful? Yeah. It's a pretty uh, pretty good investment. Think of it maybe as your Sotheby's encyclopedia yes. of a restaurant. Well, and it's, uh, and it's actually it's um, uh, sponsored by RestaurantOwner.com, which I'll also plug, which I think is great, which is uh, very similar to uh, Guildsong.com. Perfect. Hello. Perfect. Um, <laughs> it's it's a little less exciting. It's kind of like the norm core version of Guildsong. It's like very buttoned down accountants talking about um, numbers, but it's so easy to understand. Because the thing is, I'm not good at math. I'm not a math person, but I need to know it for my job, for my job or need to, and, of course. and I feel like it is not as hard as we think it is. It, the, the first leap is just getting, mm-hmm. is starting to study. I remember back in the days, I would get those, uh, you know, the P&L sheets at the manager meeting every week, and it was like, 
Okay, my number's good. Do I need to be here? You know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but the, the problem is, you're probably not, should have paid more you're attention. You're not involved. Yeah, you're, they're nothing yeah. involved. You know, and and I've been in PML, PL meetings too, where like, well, you know, this is high, and then it's like, all right, next thing. You're like, why are what? what? No, this is why is it high? What do, what can right. we do? What can everyone at this table do to lower linen cost? You know, linen cost or something like that. You know, there are things. The reason the PL exists is so that we can pinpoint things that are out of line and, and then take action. So many meetings that we have or that, you know, uh, Psalms or beverage, beverage managers are in, you know, they're just like, okay, my wine cost is good. Like, shh, exactly. I can duck out, like can I'm order, safe. Can I place no my orders now? Yell, yeah. No one's gonna yell at me. Yeah, under, the, uh, but, under the table, you're texting in your orders. Yeah, yeah. but, but there, there's so many things that, that you do just being on the floor that can affect m many more numbers than your beverage costs. Now, what are some differences between maybe running a small, casual restaurant versus a bigger, more high volume, high dollar? So, a lot. And, and I've actually had gotten to do both, which, mm -hmm. which is really fun because I get to fuse both. Um, a, the, the first thing is your staff. So in a, in a, in a larger restaurant, you, you're a little bit more removed. It's a management position. Mm -hmm. In a smaller restaurant, you, you're, it's a little bit more of a family atmosphere. So uh, a little, there's a little bit more closeness. Um, in a larger restaurant, you have more systems, uh, typically, especially in chain, chain restaurants. And, and uh, you know, we disparage chain restaurants sometimes, but there are so many things we can learn from them. They're making so much more money. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. making so much more money because they have systems and everything is idiot proofed. And why not idiot proof your life? Because if you do, if you take all these systems that you learn in the bigger restaurant and bring them to your small restaurant, uh -huh. you can basically just coast I and mean, you just be lazy. You're like, all right, I just got this checklist. It, 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 it makes life easier. So there we get systems. to the, the title of this show posted on the, on the Facebook <laughs> about how you can do whatever you want if you really get yeah, your, you your stuff do. together. That's not a, I don't my want to point say that. behind that was, <laughs> I didn't mean to get you in trouble when we did that, but my point behind that was to say, if you have your team and if you have your numbers tight, yeah. then you, you know, just do it's free and easy. You can take that trip to France and then not come back to a smoldering ruins yeah. of what you're used have to your restaurant. Ba yes. The basic thing that you need to do is if there is a question, know what the answer is before it's asked so that when it is asked or when it's asked multiple times, you know what the answer is. So, so we have a patio uh, and you know, we always let our guests know that there is, that they're going to be sat on the patio if they make a reservation because you know, maybe it is heated, it's enclosed, it's lovely, but you right. know, they might want to be in the main dining room. It's, it's broke every time. And I like pour it into the staff and every time they make a reservation. So no, it's never, so if somebody, uh, makes that reservation, I don't have to worry about them coming and be like, oh, oh, I thought I was going to be inside. You know, it's just this obvious foregone mm -hmm. conclusion. We have this system in place. That is how it's going to work. You know, we always order on the same day certain things, you know, that, that way some, it's just going to happen. They, they just, things become a little bit more natural and easy when you have systems in place. Mm -hmm. And then the trickle down of that is that you don't have to shuffle the dining room and everything runs smoother. Yes, and then exactly. Like, everything and the is guests easier, are happy systems, and yeah, therefore yeah. success. Yes. That's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah, because well, you're not stressed. And everyone knows when you're stressed out too. It, it transfers. So what are some of the numbers that you were talking about that you really need to know to be, to be on, in control of the restaurant, so, to assess the status of the restaurant? And to, so every restaurant is different. And the unfortunate thing is that a lot of um, owners and general managers aren't very transparent in letting their staff know whether or not the restaurant is doing well. Uh, so the, the first thing to do is if you don't know is ask and become more involved in that conversation. Um, the biggest number that we, we talk about and that we act, I actually don't hear discussed enough is prime cost. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to just talk about beverage costs. We don't want to just talk about labor or food. We want to talk about all those together and that's your prime cost. Um, if we're at, I think I mentioned it before, if we're at 65% of your, sa mm -hmm. your sales before taxes, that you're, 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 oh, you're okay. You're doing pretty good. Any higher than nine and, and you want to be putting some red flags up and thinking so about. So what is, what is prime? It's food plus beverage? Food, beverage, labor. Okay. The things you have in control, you, you are in control of as a manager. Mm -hmm. So that's why, is it, that's why that is the most important number to you as a manager because you know, you don't, you don't negotiate the rent. Mm -hmm. You know, right. you don't, you don't. The lights are going to be however much they're going to be. The fixed cost. So those are the things that you and that and you have so much control over that. 
You know, you, you can schedule appropriately. You can schedule the right people. You can you know, work on your beverage costs. You can make sure there's no waste in the, you know, the kitchen or food that's, you, you can watch food comps. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot that you can do day to day on the floor to make sure that that cost is not you know, getting out of line. I, so now we get to the, the costs and cost of goods, and that's a big topic that we wanted to get into, uh, running the beverage end of the program. You know, all the different standard cost of goods and then alternative cost of goods. How do they differ as far as the end result, which is making the restaurant money, making it profitable, and also so, you know, keeping your boss happy? So are we talking about what, what the industry standard is? As exactly, so the industry standard and some things that other people do, what you so, may have seen that's been successful. Yeah, versus, so what uh, you need to do is you just need to be very clear when you're talking with the manager or general manager or owner, what are my benchmarks, what do I want? Do I want a 35% cost of goods for wine program? Or do we want to do something a little bit lower? Do we have a lot of, you know, do we want to do like a huge buy the glass program and a bunch of wines on tap and, and that can help lower? Uh, you have to define what your program is, the style of it, and you have to define a number. And then, and then reevaluate. You're never set in stone, I think is the important thing we need to know. Like if, if you're working with uh, 33% cost of goods or something, and, and you feel like maybe this isn't right for a restaurant. I mean, we want to drive more walk-in traffic. We want to be known as a place where you can have just a quick glass of wine for like a happy hour. Maybe you want to do a little bit higher cost of goods and have a cheaper glass of wine. Mm-hmm. You have an $8 glass of wine that you buy for $12 a bottle or something like that. And have walk-in traffic and have more, have more butts and seats, you know? You have to define what you want, and, and I think a large, a large part of deciding what your cost of goods is going to be or what you want to hit is just having a really open communication with the, own, the man, other management and owners as to what the style of the restaurant is going to be. Mm-hmm. So covers versus PPA and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I always found that if the, get, if the glass sales got out of line versus the bottles, then the PPA tended to take a hit. You were doing a little bit less yeah. on the price per person per guest. I, I, I can see that, but I, but I think it all, that's so, I can't really speak to it specifically because it's so subjective to what kind of restaurant we're in, mm-hmm. you know? Okay. So you have to define what your goals are and, and then, and just look at those specific points with owners and management and decide who, who you, who you want to be. Another thing I think is a big decision that beverage managers and people have to make is that difference between a, a six ounce pour and a five ounce pour. Can yes. you talk about what your opinions are on that? And, so uh, I love a six ounce pour because I like drinking. <laughs> um, but I, I think you have um, one reason that, that I don't do a six ounce pour in my restaurant is because we are a drive pretty much for everybody. So, you know, three six ounce pours and we're almost at a bottle of wine mm-hmm. for somebody. And, and I, I. I don't feel like the public is really aware when you're handing a glass of wine how much is in there, whether it's five or six. And alcohol is so high mm-hmm. nowadays that so so I, I feel like you know it's appropriately priced five ounce glass is better. And one of the ways that I mitigate somebody wanting a little bit of a bigger glass is I do carafes. Oh, okay. So I have five ounce pours, and then we also have little like Erlenmeyer flasky things that are um, uh, I think about eight point they're. 250 milliliters, so, so like 8.5 or something. Yes, yeah. exactly. Cortinos, yeah. Yeah, and so that's that's about a glass and a half, or a little more than a glass and a half. Okay. Or la- and um. You know, another way to I think that it's been successful for me is to sell it to the servers and say, "Well, do you want to sell, sell them another glass?" Yes. It's easier to well, sell that second glass than uh, a five ounce pour. Second glasses are a huge thing that I don't think a lot of beverage managers focus on enough because if you. I, if you get a whole another round of second glasses on the table, that's equivalent to having two more guests in a restaurant. Yeah. You know? You it's, can't it's, sell them another you, entree. Got, you can't sell another, yeah. you're not going to sell two more entrees, but you can sell, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, you don't want to over serve a guest, but I think it's very, it's a very easy way to get sales. And then also another fun way to touch the table too. Mm-hmm. Hey, did you like the Pinot? Do you want another one? Or do you want to try something else? This is a lot like it, but it's mm-hmm. a little bit different if you're feeling adventurous. The other thing is, you know, with the price of all wines kind of escalating, when you're doing a five pour, five ounce pour, you get five pours per bottle, so you can use a higher quality wine. Yes. And maybe yeah. price it a little bit below bottle price. And that's really important yeah. to me too, is having small 
producers that are you know really like they're small, local, they're fun, or kind of off the beaten path, old world, old world producers, things that our guests probably aren't going to get mm-hmm. elsewhere, that they're not going to find in um, you know the, the supermarket down the street or uh, at another restaurant even. Like I, I really want the wine list to be as much of a draw as the food. Like. Mm-hmm. Oh, what kind of cool gruner do you have today? You know, that, that's yeah. really important. Well, that's always been my take on restaurants. You know, they how's the wine list and how's the wine list and do they have food, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's I go, I go wine. My husband is all about the food, so I, I always just make sure that there's good wine. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, great. Uh, that's it's. Uh, we just touched the surface here. I mean, we could go on forever. Are here, we done? They're flailing at us, saying that we got to wrap things up pretty soon. <laughs> Went by quickly, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, it was so, crazy. Uh, it was yeah. a lot of fun. We might do this again and get more into this. Uh, any questions, you know, we can uh, follow up and, and answer some more questions. But I think we just scratched the surface as far as, you know, how another angle to be able to succeed in this business. So thanks for coming and joining us. Thank and you. We've got a little fun. bit of this uh, Philip Tony Tan Bark Hill Cabernet. This is the second label from Philip Tony, a legend in Napa Valley up on Spring Mountain. So we're excited Cheers, to have that today. Thank you. Oh. Thanks for checking us out and come back next month. And we're going to have another guest on uh, Tips of the Trade for Buy Psalms for Psalms and uh, have some more fun here. So thanks for ch- tuning in.